welcome to our next session. Uh, our next speaker will be Brian Williams, uh, who's going to tell us about algebraic quantum field theory. And a quick note if anyone here happens to have good notes, then email it to us. We'd like to post notes on the website for the conference. So you find yourself with wonderful notes. Please share. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot, David. And yeah, thank you everyone for coming to attend our first week of this program uh, via this conference. Uh, it's very great to see all the people. Um, yeah, so maybe another uh, word of warning about my title. There's no von Neumann algebras in this talk. I'm not actually doing algebraic quantum field theory. Maybe better would have been derived algebraic quantum field theory, but that would have been a little scary. Uh, so that's the first caveat. Uh, so the, the goal of my lectures uh, is to sort of go towards a, a famous duality that much of this program is centered around this Langlands program from the point of view of quantum field theory. Um, my lectures will mostly focus on sort of uh, traditional quantum field theory in the sense that I won't be doing anything arithmetic. Uh, but I hope that as, as sort of an outcome of both my talks and uh, Minyang's talks, I hope that we could try to draw some more parallels the way he was explaining to us and, and maybe uncover some, some uh, deeper connections between the arithmetic side and um, traditional approaches to how we think about quantum field theory. So that, that's sort of the overarching goal. Um, I want to start just with some motivation of this uh, uh, Langlands program as seen from a certain quantum field theory, but very quickly I'm going to sort of diverge into some general aspects of quantum field theory, and David's going to take, take it from there uh, as far as Langlands goes. Uh, so, um, so schematically, Very schematically, uh, this sort of uh, Langlands duality as interpreted in quantum field theory is in a, a duality or equivalence between two different topological quantum field theories, which I'll call, uh, so they're both associated to a, a group, um, complex reductive for me all the time. Um, and sort of very schematically, I'm gonna write it like this. So here, uh, G is a complex reductive group and G check denotes the, the Langlands dual group here. And um, this notation is meant to be sort of uh, evocative of a famous duality many of you may be more familiar with, which is uh, mere symmetry. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about the left and right hand side as the A and B model, if you like, but very importantly, this is not a two dimensional duality like it is in mere symmetry, but this, these are uh, four dimensional, four -dimensional uh, topological field theories. So as, as Min Young was, was explaining in his talk, um, very grateful for this, uh, there's an axiomatic approach to topological field theories, which is sort of functorial in nature. So to a certain co-dimension submanifold of a certain fixed four manifold, we assign some invariance, some mathematical invariance. So let me just unpack this a little bit in the context of 4D TFTs. Uh, so for example, to a four manifold, that's the top dimension here. Well, this topological field theory, which Min Young was calling Z, uh, assigns a number. Uh, so just a, just a number. If you like, this is sort of, quote, the partition function of the four-dimensional field theory. Um, and then as we go down in, in, in dimension, up in co-dimension, so for example, a three-manifold, Sort of most simply, I'm going to take a, uh, the assignment of a three manifold to be a vector space. Actually, in my talk, uh, I'm going to immediately divert from the simplification. It's actually essential for me to consider not just vector spaces, but uh, differentially graded vector spaces, so cochain complexes. And that's also necessary here, really, to, to get <laughs> under the hood and make some more careful statements. Um, but for now, just think about a vector space. Um, and moreover, if you have a bounding four manifold, we have an element of this vector space. So uh, if m if m four is a bounding four manifold, then uh, you should think about uh, this uh, functor z as assigning a, an element of this vector space here. And we can go down so uh, to a two manifold. Sort of the rule is as you go down in in dimension, you go up in sort of categorical dimension. So to a two manifold, what this data assigns is a category. 
And the same sort of caveat holds for, uh, as I made for vector spaces, really this is some sort of infinity category, some DG category if you wanna be explicit. Um, and similarly, if we have a, a bounding three manifold, then we have an element, an object in this category. And we can go down even further, uh, which I won't. But at, at this sort of level of rigor, one way to unpack this, this statement of, of duality here sort of maybe most uh, sort of uh, famously is to evaluate this duality on a two manifold. So that's like, uh, call it just an oriented two manifold sigma for now. So what this duality sort of implies, if you believe this, this conjecture here, is that we have an equivalence of categories between what the sort of A side assigns to a two dimensional surface and what the B side assigns to the same surface. So this is an equivalence. Uh, you don't yet know what a topological field theory is. I don't really know it in full generality here either, but as, an, as a consequence, what we have is an equivalence of categories, which is something we can understand. And um, maybe just to give you a sort of flavor of where some Langland's statements are coming from, um, sort of very, very, very roughly, the, the sort of best hope sort of conjecture about the, uh, this duality is that this A side should be identified with something like the category of D modules on bun G. This is the category of principal G bundles on, uh, on a, a Riemann surface sigma. Can look at D modules on that. And uh, on the right-hand side, uh, this, this sort of B side looks like quasi-coherent sheaves. On the space of flat G bundles. One sigma. Uh, flat G check bundles. So this is sort of, a, if you like, a sort of best hope sort of expectation from the Langlois program, which is obviously false, as I stated it, it needs some corrections. But um, just to start to draw the analogy early, um, you should think about this side as being sort of like the geometric side. That's what the sort of A-type topological field theory assigns, and or 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 uh, automorphic, if you like. And on the B side, we get something which is uh, sort of spectral or Galois type, uh, has spectral or Galois sort of information. Um, well, even I think defining the objects on the left and right hand side in a way that you could have such an equivalence, I think is very hard to do. Um, did I say obviously? I'm sorry. It's not, yes, very sorry. It's not obvious at all how to even formulate this correctly so that it could be a true statement. Let me say that. Okay. So um, I'm not gonna go into it too much at a schematic level now, because I hope to return to um, a lot of these issues uh, as my series goes on, but really as sort of as hinted here, the, the main package of a topological field theory for, for me is sort of knowing what uh, these sort of, th this object does on, on defects or of submanifolds of a given here, a four manifold here. And as we saw here, it's, it's sort of relevant what's going on to a, a to a Riemann surface, and we get some statement about an equivalence of categories. So uh, sort of in, in a physics sense, uh, sort of the, the package of, of defects have some names, um, they're, they're good names. So let's just look at some uh, examples in dimension two. So here uh, in a physical theory, these objects of dimension two are called surface operators. Um, in the Langlands uh, sort of context, um, maybe I will talk about it as probably not until the last lecture, if any, and maybe David will talk about it. These surface operators are related to um, ramifications in, in geometric Langland. Um, in dimension one, these give what are called line operators in your quantum field theory. 
And in the Lang lens context, these, these uh, sort of produce well-known objects called HECA operators. And uh, in dimension zero, which is maybe too boring, but it's actually for me the most interesting, uh, too bo boring in a topological sense, very interesting of a invariant of a quantum field theory though, these give local operators. And these are maybe sort of less understood in the, in the Langlands context, but uh, have been studied recently by um, people like uh, Phil Sengyu and Chris Elliott and many others um, in relating to uh, singular support conditions on various sides of, of these two uh, categories here. Um, so I just said some words that uh, sort of connected to Langlands, but these are very general features of any quantum field theory. You should try to understand, given any, say, four-dimensional field theory, uh, what these sort of objects represent, uh, either geometrically or gauge theoretically, et cetera. Um, and part of what I'm going to do is try to explain a mathematical package for sort of accessing these sorts of operators. So I'm going to back up a ton, leave the world of topological field theory, and I'm going to basically explain some rudiments of classical field theory first. And from there, by the end of this lecture, I'll motivate some quantum ideas as well. So. What is a classical field theory? So at a very basic level, a classical field theory is about studying solutions to some very, some potentially very interesting system of partial differential equations. And we really like partial differential equations when they come via some variational problem. So typically the sort of situation we have is uh, some action functional. So here phi is called a field. And um, this equations of motion arise from extremizing some functional of, of the field phi, which is of the following type. So this looks like an integral of some density. And to get really nice theories, you ask that this density be totally local. So it depends just basically on the jets of your field phi, just taking possibly complicated partial derivatives of the field phi, um, and then spitting out a, a density, something I can integrate. So here, uh, phi is the field, and this is the action functional. And here's some flavors of, of this sort of um, this sort of picture. Um, so first, we could have theories which are actually quite nice mathematically called uh, sigma models. So here, uh, typically the the field is understood as a map. So it's called sigma because we denote the source by sigma. Um, and the fields here are typically uh, smooth maps from uh, some manifold sigma to another manifold x. I don't think so. And uh, maybe as a, as a typical example of, of a sigma model, um, you can sort of write down an action which depends on some geometric data. So this data here depends on a Ramanian metric. And the action here, S of phi looks like the integral over sigma of phi nabla phi. Yeah. So to make sense of this, I actually need to fix both a metric on x and a metric on sigma. And the equations of motion here are not so hard to deduce, have to do with studying harmonic functions. So those are the, that's the PDE we find there. Um, here's a second sort of example. 
Um, this is a, a sort of very basic example of a gauge theory uh, that Min Young talked about called Chern Simons. And here the action, the field here is a one form. Say, uh, let me actually just say it's a connection. So, so this is a connection on some principal G bundle, call it P, uh, which lives over a three manifold. And the action here is the famous Chern Simons. So what appears is the famous Chern Simons Lagrangian, integrated over the three manifold. And uh, the equations of motion here also produce a very well studied PDE, namely the condition that this connection, so the equations of motion say that this connection be flat. So this is, a, uh, this is an example of something I said I wouldn't talk too much about, but it's very nice for mathematicians. It's, a topolo it's an example of a topological field theory in the sense that unlike this, say, single model example, there's no dependence on any sort of metric data on space-time. Here, space-time being the, the three manifold. Yeah. Um, there's other classes of, of topological field theories that I'll talk about maybe eventually, which have to, which are, which are closely related to supersymmetry. Um, that's another way in which we produce topological field theories that we understand. Um, which is very relevant to the Langlands program, but this is sort of a, a great example to, to run with, Chen Simons, and it's very much closely related, obviously, to Min Young's lectures. Yeah. Uh, so the non-trivial uh, bundle, if you concern about this A bundle, what is defined? Um, sh sh sure, then you'd have to glue the um, this Chen Simons Lagrangian uh, you're worried about not not having a one form description. Uh, it may depend on a choice, yeah. So uh, actually for most of what I'll say, I'm, I'm in the context of Trin Simons, I will fix a trivialization, but there, there, it's a good question. Does it depend, does this Trin Simons functional depend on that trivialization? I'm not gonna talk about that. But I did want to um, point out uh, a common feature to both of these, both of these examples, and, and a common feature to basically all the examples that of field theories which are constructed in this way from an action functional, um, which is that enjoy sort of a, a basic version of locality. So uh, all the the sort of fields enjoy the following locality. Um, which to, to say it sort of compactly is they, the, the fields here all form sheaves on space-time. So they form a sheaf on space-time. And more importantly, actually, is not just the fields form a sheaf on space-time, but the solutions to the equations of motion also form a sheaf on space-time. That has to do with the fact that I've chose my equations of motion to come from some variational principle, which arises from a local action function. So it seems like a silly remark to make, but it's very important. Um, and moreover, in, in actually in, in perturbative approaches to uh, quantum field theory, which is what I'm uh, mostly an expert in, is we, we make even a, a, a more drastic assumption, is we assume that the fields uh, all come as all come as sections of some possibly graded vector bundle. Where we really have the most control over, uh, over making precise sense of what we mean by a quantum theory, which I haven't yet gotten to.
course, neither of these examples fit that mold uh, as well. This is the fields here do form a sheaf on, on, on sigma. It's not in any sense maps are not sections of any sort of vector bundle. And in here, as was pointed out, is I'm not, unless I choose some trivialization of P, I also cannot write it globally in that way either. Um, so there's, there's, there's uh, sort of really interesting sort of things that are going on globally, but at least sort of locally in perturbative quantum field theory, I can make this assumption. Is there a question? Um, I, I would say that uh, uh, sort of space time, fixed space time, yeah. So a, a topological field theory would be something that produces a sheaf on space times. So say the category of all manifolds. I can't make sense of that here already. I could maybe look at the category of Ramanian manifolds and then it, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I think it depends maybe who you are. Uh, for, for all intents and purposes, I would call sigma for me the space time. That's because I'm thinking about this as a field theory on sigma. Um, but there's context in which you would want to sort of reverse that perspective and think about this as actually a field theory on X. Um, if you're a string theorist, you probably would do that. Um, there's no debate here what space time is, but you were asking about this. Great question. Any other questions? Okay. So um, this comment about locality leads me to my sort of first definition, very, very sort of um, naive definition. And it's going to need to be not, not corrected, but we're going to need to amend it a bit. But here's a preliminary definition. And it sort of gets at my uh, approach to quantum field theory, which is through the object called observables of a, of a field theory. So uh, the classical observables of a field theory is, uh, I'll call it obs classical. which are uh, functions on the equations of motion. For me, C or R, <clears throat> field of characteristic zero. But if you're going to do, if you're going to do something more arithmetic, you should definitely choose a different, make a different choice. Um, but yeah, for me, just yeah, C valued. functions. Um, and I really mean here in, in my context, equations of motion will always have some sort of algebraic definition. And I really mean like either polynomial or like Taylor series sort of functions here, um, just to get the analysis to work out nicely. Um, other fields. So that's going to lead me to my, uh, yeah, I'm going to have a, uh, let me make a remark about this more carefully in a minute, but um, yeah, somehow the, the reason I want to state it like this is because oftentimes, uh, you know, what we should really care about and what physicists really care about are solutions to equations of motion. There could be many different action functional descriptions of the same equations of motion. So it's sort of nonsense to talk about functions on, on fields without any reference to the equations of motion here. It's really, this is what's important. Um, this is what you're trying to sort of study. Um, those original PDEs. In my approach, that sort of gets uh, <clears throat> welded together in the sense that, uh, as, as I was saying before, like this, this right here is clearly, a, a, the way I'm defining it is a vector space. But as I said, I, I'm, I really want to think about DG vector spaces or chain complexes. And in, in that setting, uh, the equations of motion, this condition of solving the equations of motion is implemented homologically. So it looks like a cohomology problem. And in that sense, what you end up looking are functions on Yes, some big space of fields like this, but there's some differential around which you 
you want to uh, take cohomology with respect to to get something sort of physical, if you like, or meaningful. Um, but sort of at, at this heuristic level, yes, it's really the equations of motion that matter. Yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll have a particular way of resolving this. Yeah. What is this, uh, th these remarks here, what do they say about uh, this object that I just defined? Is it also enjoys some locality on space time, but the variance is flipped. So because I'm looking at functions, functions pull back, this thing's a, a co-sheaf on space time. So this thing is a, is a co-sheaf. This is a co-sheaf on space time. And uh, it's, it has even more structure. It's a co-sheaf of algebras. And algebras, because I'm just writing functions here. I know how to multiply functions. In fact, that operation is commutative. So I have a co-sheaf on space-time of commutative algebras. And let me leave that. There's one more bit of structure that I'm going to employ, but let me not say anything about that yet. For now, this is sort of the the most naive definition of observables of a field theory. And really all it knows about the structure here, it just comes from all the structure we have on the equations of motion. So it's just another way of repackaging. So uh, some remarks. So um, as, as Min Yang brought up, uh, it's really important for me to work in a derived sense. Uh, so the equations of motion for me will be implemented homologically. That may seem a bit superfluous in many examples, uh, especially say in that scalar, that free scalar example that I just wrote down, but it's one way to really access the sorts of structures Min Young was referencing, say these shifted symplectic structures in a, in, a, in a very nice way, in a very direct way from the description of a field theory as an action functional. So uh, just as a, as a heuristic here, you know, I was writing the equations of motion before I was describing them as uh, the critical locus of some action functional, S. And that's gonna be replaced by uh, some resolution. So I'll just sort of write that schematically like this. Some derived version of the, of the critical locus. And the sort of amazing, the amazing fact here is that this thing is always minus one shifted symplectic. Exactly, yeah, so this is just the classical BV formalism. So this is called the uh, classical. So the, the formulation of equations of motion as a shifted symplectic object is what's referred to as the classical batalan vilkovitsky formalism. And as David said, these ideas go back to the 80s, uh, if not earlier than that. Uh, Um, originally just in the context of gauge theories, um, but it's convenient for us to use this sort of in general as a description of a classical field theory. I'll show you in, in an example. So here, here's maybe a finite dimensional toy model for what I mean here. Uh, and you'll see exactly the dependence. So th this, this is like describing, so in, in sort of, Zero dimensions, what do I mean by zero dimensions? I mean the space-time here is zero dimensional. Therefore, the fields will have an interpretation as some finite dimensional object. So I might as well just take the fields, so fields sad. to be represented by some manifold.
Yeah, maybe I'll turn this. I can't. It says not allowed to touch that. Yeah, we'll ask him. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, thanks. So the, the, uh, a nice way to sort of describe this shifted symplectic structure is in finite dimensions where it really comes from an explicit causal resolution of a, of a singularity. So here, uh, what you're interested in is the critical locus of S, which one way to think about this is to look at the intersection of the graph of the derivative of S um, with the zero section inside of the cotangent bundle to X. And a causal, sort of, a causal resolution is exactly the sort of thing that derives this construction here. So taking it from an intersection to, uh, if you like, a derived intersection. Uh, and there's a, there's a model for this, this uh, DG model for the derived critical locus here of S, which is as uh, T star minus one, of X itself. Um, I should say equivalent because there could be many models. We're now working in a derived setting where I shouldn't be tied to a single model. Where does the action function come in? Well, to describe the, the data of a DG manifold in this, in this setting here, I also have to not only prescribe the underlying manifold, but also some homological vector field acting on it. And in that case here, it's exactly given by the action. So it's exactly, uh, you can think about it as in a Hamiltonian picture as bracketing with the original function S where this is really the Poisson bracket that I have on any cotangent bundle. Here, of course, it's gonna have some shifted parity because I have T star minus one. Uh, so if I were to draw this uh, sort of really, really explicitly, uh, I'm describing some, some sort of DG object, I should look at its algebra of functions. What it looks like, well, I'm taking functions on this. Uh, I'll see a part of it will be functions just on X, but then there'll also be functions on the fiber direction as well. And um, that's exactly what's popping out are the algebra of poly vector fields on X. So here by by O, if you like, if I'm working with a manifold, I mean functions which are sort of algebraic along the fiber. That's why poly vector field comes out. Um, doesn't matter so much here because the fiber is odd and X is say finite dimensional. So there's no loss in generality. And uh, this thing has some weird degree. So uh, because I've done this shift here, but if I were to write it out, uh, what I mean by this degree shift is that it starts in degree, say, minus the dimension of n of x. So that's like uh, PV to the dimension of x of x. And then uh, there's a differential here. So here we're going to PV dim minus 1. There's a differential here, which is bracketing with s, which geometrically is just contraction with the one form that is ds. So that's, if you unpack what this bracket is, that's what, uh, that's what bracketing with S is giving you geometrically. And then we go all the way down to degree zero, which is just functions. And... and if you think about it for a minute, uh, what's happening in the zeroth cohomology here is functions on X modulo the relations span by D of S. That's, that's exactly the critical locus of S. So H zero is at least recovering the right thing. And then this is some, some resolution of this, which possibly contains some information, say on how non-transverse this intersection is.
So in this finite dimensional setting, this is exactly what I'm calling the classical observables. Yeah, yeah. So this is that commutative algebra I was advertising over here. It's exactly this thing now interpreted in a derived sense. So this is some commutative DG algebra. What we're missing out on is a very important feature that I was emphasizing on this size, side, which was locality. But as I said, this is really like a zero dimensional example. So there's like no locality. I mean, the locality doesn't tell you anything extra. So the, the, the two sort of ideas that combine for me are gonna be this sort of homological approach to action functionals and equations of motion together with this locality principle, which is gonna be modified when we go to the quantum level. Um, okay, so let's go to the quantum level. Min Young already did a really great job of motivating some of this, so uh, I thank him for that. But I'll start with the same. Uh, I'll start with the same motivation. So the goal here is to describe correlation functions of observables. That was one of the primary reasons I brought in observables so early. But now the goal at the, at the quantum level is to understand something of this flavor. So this is a expectation value of an observable of a field theory as an mm -hmm. integral over the fields. That's what an expectation value is against some measure, which has the form e to the minus s uh, over h bar. Um, and then there's, to, you know, to integrate this, we have to insert something like a measure, which I don't yet know how to define in general. But so, so and I, and I want to point out two of the challenges, which I'll address right now. So the first challenge is, uh, well, past quantum field theories of dimension zero, the space of fields is always infinite dimensional. How do we integrate over a space which is infinite dimensional? What does it mean to have a top form, for example, on a space which is infinite dimensional? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Um, and then second, related to this issue, is uh, making sense of this measure. So how do we how do we define this measure? And these these two problems are are related and have a, a sort of common solution also via uh, the batalan vilkovitsky formalism um, in my setting as, as sort of interpreted by uh, people like Kevin Costello and, and C. Lee, who's in the audience right now, uh, who've done um, some uh, really nice work in sort of making, uh, answering these two questions in a, in a rigorous sense, which is the, the sense in which I'm following today. Okay. So uh, before getting into any of the technical details, uh, I probably won't return to this at all, but I wanted to give just a flavor of, of how this calculus looks sort of explicitly, even, even in, in my setting. Uh, and uh, the sort of basic thing to start with in, in again, zero dimensions is uh, the simple Gaussian integral. So the motivation for this, well, I said there was a condition on action functionals. We needed them to satisfy some locality. Um, in sort of perturbative approaches to mm -hmm. quantum field theory, it's also extremely useful to assume that S is at least, has, has a very nice sort of quadratic piece. This is called the kinetic term in an action functional. Um, and maybe let me explain why, why that's very nice in the zero dimensional context. So there, in, in zero dimensions, the sort of integral you ended up 
you end up looking at. So here, this Rn here, this is now, this is not where the field theory lives. This is like the space of fields. Um, so I know how to define a measure here. Dxi, I'm gonna normalize it by some square roots of two pi. And then I can look at a general Gaussian of the form uh, a, uh, x, a, x, where A here is some symmetric matrix. So this is my sort of ansatz for the simplest zero dimensional free field theory. Free because uh, it only has a quadratic term. And uh, there's a beautiful formula for this given by one over the square root of the determinant. So that's fine. We could, if you want to remind yourself of that and you're really bored, you can do it while I'm talking. Um, but what's, what's very interesting is to not consider just this very simple free action, but to deform it. And to deform it, uh, I mean by uh, deforming it by terms which are of higher order. So these don't, it doesn't, I don't want to just correct the kinetic term. I want to introduce what are called interactions. So this is a, a cubic plus higher order polynomial. Then there's a nice, there's a very nice schematic for evaluating integrals of this type. So same measure. Um, now I'm looking at e to the minus sx. So the commonality between these two is that they have the same quadratic term. And you can understand this explicitly. There's factors of one over the determinant again. But you can, the, the sort of beautiful part is that you can understand this as a sum over graphs, even in, even in this simple finite dimensional setting. And it's sum over graphs of some, some invariant I attach to I called the weight, uh, I in a graph called the weight of a graph. Um, and it's normalized by the automorphism of that graph. So uh, here, this is a sum over connected graphs. And the sort of benefit in writing it in this way is that uh, we turn basically a problem in analysis to a problem basically just in linear algebra or combinatorics. These weights are combinatorial to evaluate in nature. And that's, that's sort of a... Um, that's a, a lesson that you can even take to the quantum field theoretic setting, the infinite dimensional setting, which is why this is a useful formula. This is really, uh, goes back to Feynman, this is the original Feynman diagrammatic expansion of this, of this path integral here. This very simple looking path. Integral. Yes. 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 No, not there. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. It's, yeah, let me include it in the weight. Yeah. But it's an asset. Okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm really doing something perturbative here, as was just emphasized. Um, this is some expansion for this Gaussian as a, as a uh, function of h bar. And this is an asymptotic formula in that parameter h bar. Thanks. That, 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 was, that was really the key remark here. Yeah, that was really the key remark. I appreciate that. No, 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 this is, this is, this is not a finite sum. Connected graphs. Yeah. 
Yeah. By graph, I just mean connected graph here. Yeah, finite graph. Sorry, not finite sum. Finite graph. Yeah. Um. And the, the sort of flavor for these weights here, uh, so for example, uh, say my interaction was something uh, cubic, that's allowed. This combinatorial expression for the weight, uh, maybe I'll just draw a picture. Um, so for example, I can consider a graph like this. So for, first off, what the Interaction tells me is the sort of vertices that I'm allowed to include in this sum. So I am summing over all graphs here, but on many of the graphs, the weight just may be zero for type reasons. So when I have a cubic action here, what this means is that the only non-zero weights are gonna come from graphs that are trivalent. So for example, I could look at the following trivalent graph. And the, the way you compute this is by sort of schematically what you imagine is you insert the interaction at all of the vertices. That's a cubic thing. So that depends cubically on the fields. And then on the edges, you insert this matrix A, or really it's inverse. And this number I get out, so this is now a number, well, Yes, it's a number, so I'm I'm <laughs> I'm encoding h bar sort of h bar the h bar dependence only depends on the genus. Um, this is just some number then. Uh, that's the weight of of the graph, uh, and um, what did I want to say? The sort of interpretation here in in sort of physical terminology is that this a inverse that appears on all the edges is what's called the propagator. So I'm, I'm, so you think about A inverse here as uh, this is something which lives in, uh, so let, let me just say, uh, let me write, let's write it like this. So this is, this is a matrix, right? So it lives in something like Rn tensor Rn. Each of these legs is labeled by a dual copy of Rn and I'm just doing all of the sort of linear algebraic contractions. So this is just some massive contraction. I'm just combining all of the tensors that I get from A inverse and then contracting them with all the tensors I get from the interaction. Is that? Okay. I, I wanted to mention this as, the, as playing the role of the propagator because you already see maybe what can go wrong in uh, a field theoretic context now. So let's take, for example, let's go back to the free scalar. So let's just look at phi uh, just a function on a Ramanian manifold. And then the action here, I, I wrote down the free action, which was uh, phi nabla phi. And say I wanted to deform it. So I wanted to study expectation values in some deformed theory, which depends on some interaction, which maybe I'll call uh, phi to the fourth. It doesn't really matter what the polynomial is, but I just wanted to say then you would, the sort of schematic for Feynman diagrammatic expansion is to follow this analogy here to try to make sense of that path integral by replacing everything you see in this graph with the corresponding object you have in infinite dimensions. So here, the role of the propagator, well, A here is the Laplacian now. So A is this, uh, matrix, which is acting on the space of fields. That matrix here is the Laplacian. And here the propagator then is the inverse to that matrix. And the way to make sense of this inverse is as a Green's function. So here the X and Y denote now coordinates on M. These play the role of these sort of indices that you have in finite dimensions. Those are like the indices for the fields are taking values on.
And um, for example, on uh, if m were just r to the d, this this Green's function is very well understood. There's an asymptotic expansion for this as one over one minus uh, sorry the one over the distance between x and y raised to the d minus second power. But now, even from this this formula here for the uh, this sort of asymptotic expansion for the Green's function of the Laplacian, you see there's a problem in making sense of this diagrammatic calculus here. The issue being that in performing these contractions to obtain the weight, inevitably I'm going to have to multiply distributions which have overlapping support, thus giving rise giving rise to integrals which don't converge anymore. That in physics is what's called an ultraviolet divergence or a UV divergence. And the process to correcting it could be a very complicated one via introduction of say counter terms and things like this. So I, I won't have much time to say it, but um, let me just remark that uh, Kevin Costello and um, also uh, Celia and the audience have come up with a, a framework for um, sort of merging this solution to introducing, say, counter terms to annihilate these divergences you have in a quantum field theory with that cohomological formalism that I was mentioning in the first part of the talk, this formalism for understanding equations of motion derived algebraically. So there's a way to combine these two, um, which sort of implements the idea of normalization. So normalization plus homological EV formalism as sort of a, a sort of a model, a sort of mathematical model for at least perturbative quantum field theory. And I won't have time to say much about the renormalization part of it, but I do want to say what this homological BV formalism looks like now on the quantum side. And then I'm probably going to have to end there. No, so this is, uh, th there's no metric around in any of the statements that I'm making here, at least. Uh, so in, indeed, the example I wrote down just now did depend on a Ramanian structure. That was just meant to be an example. So for Chern Simons, for example, the kinetic term there is just the Durham operator. So the Green's function is just D inverse. You, you want a Green's function for D inverse. Same, same issue though. It's not like magically in that example that sort of a priori, all these weights are well-defined. It's a theorem that they are. This is a theorem about Chern Simons theory going back to Axelrod and Singer that you can make rigorous sense of these diagrams in Chern Simons, um, which is a more, more or less a feature about topological field theory that renormalization is quite well behaved. Um, Yeah, you in, 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 indeed you will you will see it, you will see at the at the quantum at the quantum level for sure. Yeah, but um, I, I would say uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's a very good point. So typically to um, make sense of this renormalization, even for a topological theory, you do you may have to choose some geometric data like that of a metric. And there's a well-known way to do this where the analytic torsion does pop out naturally from studying these diagrams in Chern Simons. But um, that, that's a choice. Like you, you could imagine there being other choices to renormalize Chern Simons theory, maybe that don't depend on a metric with some other piece of data. Um, it, it's a very good choice, but um, yeah. I didn't want to, uh, yeah, I, I agree that taking metrics is a nice thing, but.
there, there's, there still is a scheme uh, here, but what you end up, what sort of Costello's, Costello and Lee's sort of whole mantra is that, uh, that, that scheme dependence is sort of homotopic in nature. So um, what, what, you really, what you really get out at the end of the day is a family of effective actions, which are related under RG flow, which is interpreted as some sort of homotopy equivalence. So, you know, to, to actually write down a quantization, it may depend on some choices, some fixing of, of gauges, for example, which you can make sense of after choosing some geometric data. But at the end of the day, the sort of answers that we that can extract mathematically, you would like to be sort of scheme and sort of gauge independent. Um, yeah, I, I would, yeah, that, that statement's still true. I mean, for a non-topological theory, you could have a metric dependence from the very beginning, right? Yeah, that, that, this is a general, this is not just about topological theories, yeah. Um, it's, it's 1.30 now, so I, or 2.30 now, so maybe I'll just stop. Uh, should I, maybe five more minutes, is that a, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll go five minutes, because I wanted to explain the, this uh, homological BV, how, how it appears in the quantum situation as an attempt at making sense of this volume, this measure that I, that I hinted at before as one of the other main issues in making sense of the path integral or expectation value. So um, I wanna go back to this sort of simplified setting, the zero dimensional case where uh, X again is just a manifold, the space of fields. Then uh, we saw that the classical observables look like uh, functions on T star minus one of them of x, sorry, with uh, a differential in the Hamiltonian sort of language, it's bracketing with s, the classical action. And geometrically, I just remind you, this is like the algebra of poly vector fields on x, where the differential here is contracting with the one form ds. So th this differential only depends on s through its derivatives. So the sort of object we wanted to make sense of in the beginning was the, an integral over x here, that's the fields, of e to the minus s of x over h bar. And to make sense of this, just a function, I need to choose a volume form. So let me choose a volume form on x. I can do that on X. I can do that in finite dimensions, no problem. So uh, in, in the BV formalism, what this volume form lets me do is relate it back to these classical observables here. So I wrote down that complex before. This is like, so N here is the dimension of X. Let me just not write these arrows yet. So this appeared in degrees zero all the way to minus n. What this volume form lets me do is identify this complex with probably a more familiar complex, the Durham complex. And I'm doing that because that's really where integration lives, right? So I can identify at least the individual pieces of this via the volume form with certain pieces of the Durham complex. And in this top piece here, right, I'm just using the volume form to identify that with the top form. Here, I'm just contracting a vector field against the volume form to get an n minus one form. And going all the way down, I just contract all of a top degree poly vector with the volume form to get a function. This integral is happening over here. So this integral is happening right here. That just spits out a number. And the way to think about this integral in this Durham setting is as uh, being encoded by taking the top cohomology of X here. So in, in other words, the, the top cohomology in Durham forms of, of, sorry, of X is encoding the integral. 
the reason we don't like top forms in infinite dimensions is because, well, it's we, we don't know how to make sense of this side of the diagram. But I do know how to make sense of the top diagram. So that that sort of motivates the. Oh, so uh, I'm going to know how to make sense of the top diagram. So what I'm first going to do is I'm going to transfer via the volume form the Durham differential up here. So via all these isomorphism, what spits out in the top here? Well, it's just the Durham differential suitably sort of reorganized. That's what's called the BV Laplacian up here. It's called a Laplacian because in local coordinates, uh, if you think about it, uh, if, if you treat both the even and odd coordinates here, this thing really does look second order. Um, but just take it as a definition for now. And what, what these isomorphisms say is that uh, the ordinary integral can be understood as sort of a BV integral, which by definition here is just like uh, taking the cohomology class in this poly vector field complex here. So with this BV Laplacian here. So that is looking at uh, functions which live in PV0 modulo the condition that uh, they are exact for this BV Laplacian is another way to interpret integration. So that, that just came from transferring the Durham to Laplacian to poly vector fields. Yeah, so in, I, I wouldn't know when this bottom line stops. That's the, that's the whole problem. Um, so I'm never going to end up. But what I do know how to make sense of is studying H0 of classical observables. So what I'm saying, or of, of observables. So this is no longer classical observables. This is really like integration. So I should think about this as being part of the quantum nature of, of, of this uh, of this action functional S because I'm studying integrals. Well, right now I haven't included S at all, but maybe let me say uh, how to do that. So instead of studying just the integral against the volume form, I can study the integral against S over H bar. And this is again encoded by some cohomology, but this time it's not, it's, it, it's obtained by something very similar to this, we end up just deforming this differential. So if I want to put an H bar in work asymptotically, actually I'll just work formally. So I'll just adjoin an H bar here and then study H bar delta plus the bracketing with the classical action. here. So uh, th this is just a little bit of, of calculus if you like to go from this line to this line, how sort of multiplying by this sort of function deforms this complex here, you end up finding exactly this um, bracketing with S term that we had classically. Yeah, so the way I've set it up, this thing automatically solves quantum BV, but because S only depends on X here from my point of view. So I, I basically, I'm doing a very dumb version of, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's something more general. Uh, so, so two things could happen. So. The first thing is that you can imagine starting just with this space here, t star minus one, and equipping it with a differential that doesn't just look like bracketing with s. And you may want to still study that as a quantum field theory. Then this, this sort of whole business of introducing this Durham operator, this BV Laplacian, may not be well posed. You have to check that this differential here is actually a differential, namely it squares to zero. There's, that's a condition called the quantum master equation. Here it's sort of trivially satisfied. Um, but in infinite dimensions, when we start to work with an honest quantum field theory, as I was saying before, you know, S may not be the object we really want to consider because of this issue with UV divergences. So we'll have to do some sort of renormalization to actually write down an effective action. This is the Wilsonian approach. And in that case also, this construction is not guaranteed to be, uh, to be well posed. So also there you could have some failure for this to be a differential, that leads to what are called anomalies, or th these are sort of like gauge anomalies in, in QFT. So there's also an issue there. Th these are all good subtleties that hopefully I'll get to 
some of them. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there though. <laughs>